Okay, great. So welcome everyone. My name is Jess Roman, and this is the Berlin Epidemiological Methods Colloquium. Really glad that we have so many of you here. Uh, I know some people are still on the summer holidays and wrote me very eager to catch this talk uh, upon their return. So that's, that's exciting as well. For those of you who are brand new to the Berlin Epi Methods Colloquium, we're doing this on the first Wednesday of the month. We invite speakers uh, who we think are working on some cool methods related topics to come and talk with us. And we have one uh, with us today who I'll introduce in just a minute. It's always at 4 p.m. So this time, wherever you are on the planet, 4 p.m. Berlin time at least. And we also do a journal club on the third Wednesday of the month. You can also join us 4 p.m. Uh, same place, basically. You can find a full schedule of everything we're doing at our website, bemcolloquium.com. Enough of the advertising pitch, and we'll get to the exciting part. We have Ben von Kalster with us today. And Ben is a professor both at the KU Leuven in Belgium and at the LUMC in Leiden in the Netherlands. He works um, primarily on, let's say, biostatistical topics in clinical risk prediction models. He'll tell you a lot more about that. His field of application is gynecology. And he also sits on the ethics committee um, as the statistical, let's say, advising member. And I think sees a lot of these types of um, studies and proposals coming through and can offer some very valuable insights to those of us who are practicing in research. So I really, really like uh, to thank Ben for taking the time to be with us today and thank all of you for joining. And I think without any further ado, oh, actually, if you do have a question, put it in the Q&A. You can click on the Q&A button below. You can also upvote other people's questions if you like them. And following the talk, we'll do um, kind of an informal chat session we also have Marco Piccinini and Chisato Ito here with us today. Um, but if anybody else would like to join our little panel for the discussion, just send us a message in the chat and I'm happy to promote you after the talk to be a discussant with us today. Okay, now without further ado, Ben, thanks so much. Thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction and for the invitation um, to speak for you today. Um, I just got back from holidays, so I, I hope many of you also had uh, the time to enjoy some holidays um, recently. Anyway, um, whoop, let's see, can I, uh, yeah. Um, so before I start, I have a short disclaimer. Um, so my talk is, in my opinion, a bit experimental. Um, it's um, a, a, you know, an overview of um, enemies of reliable risk prediction. So it's not an in-depth discussion uh, of some methodological uh, topics. It's pretty high level. Um, and, and I know enemies sounds a bit negative. Um, so you may call them challenges uh, as well, if you like. Um, um, well, you can look at it from many angles, I think. Um, apart from that, I have a uh, no financial conflicts of interest. I, I developed a few prediction models that um, ended up uh, as web calculators um, that are freely available um, and that are also available um, as an app, um, which is non-free, but the income from the app covers the maintenance, basically. Um, so, okay, I, I'm not getting rich from that at all. Uh, the model formulas are free. They are published in, in, in the paper, so anyone can implement it, uh, um, him or herself. Um, and some uh, companies implemented one of uh, my models in ultrasound machines. So it's a model to diagnose ovarian cancer um, using ultrasound based uh, predictors. And so some companies uh, implemented that in their newest machines, which I think is quite exciting to get the models uh, as close to the bedside as possible. But that's basically their responsibility. Um, and for this talk, I uh, mainly have to thank uh, Maarten van Smeden, Ewout Steierberg, and Laura Wijnands for some uh, discussions, uh, formal and informal, um, about uh, my list of enemies. So, um, as this slide shows, uh, we, we have a case of leakage. If you compare the literature, uh, the applied literature on prediction modeling, 
versus um, what is being used in practice. So there are a lot of papers in which prediction models are uh, um, introduced, but there are not so many uh, models that make it all the way uh, to uh, being used in clinical uh, practice. Um, but anyway, prediction models are uh, extremely popular these days, and I think some reasons for that are, are the fact that well, there are lots of data sets available, uh, that we are really focusing on precision or at least stratified medicine, uh, that there is an increasing focus on digital uh, uh, healthcare as well, and then um, the quite recent uh, hype in machine learning uh, uh, algorithms and if you mix them all together um, some things uh, are uh, on fire probably. Um, but what is the status of um, clinical prediction modeling? Um, well I think many of you know that we have too many models and um, this is being observed in about every medical field. I mean there are tons of systematic reviews out there that uh, make this conclusion. Um, what we also see is that um, if the, uh, uh, these models are being evaluated for quality, that most of them are being labeled as high risk of bias, uh, and that there are a few validation studies of these models. Um, and uh, uh, a third thing that is pretty well known, I think, is that there are even fewer impact studies of these models, uh, studies on uh, how to implement them in practice and what the effect of uh, using the model in practice uh, is on, on process related or patient uh, outcomes. And so that's why we end up uh, with this uh, uh, leakage uh, issue uh, where we are now. Now, how did we end up here? Well, that's the core uh, topic of the talk. So I, I, I was having this list of enemies in, in my head for uh, quite some years uh, now, and I talked to, to, to some people about them. Um, and you, know, you can list up a lot of enemies or challenges if you want to use that term. And many of those are probably hiding in plain sight. So these are, many of these are not um, surprising uh, if, if you see them. I mean, uh, we know a lot of problems already. But I think understanding them can help us to get away from uh, the status quo. Uh, maybe change always happens slowly, but uh, I mean, we still have to keep trying. Uh, and so, uh, uh, as so, as some people say, you have to know your enemies. And someone uh, says that if you want to know your enemy, you have to become your enemy. I don't think we should take that too literally if we are developing our own prediction models. Um, but well, I think it's important to, to try and list the challenges um, and put them together. So, well, here, here I go and let's see what happens. So uh, let me know what you think of them and uh, whether I am missing uh, some challenges or whether I'm mistaken um, uh, for some uh, opinions. Um, I'm open for uh, criticism and, and other comments. Uh, so let me know. So the first uh, uh, challenge are the academic incentives. We all know that. I mean, this is um, I mean, like an open door. Um, and I've recently uh, written some kind of frustration paper about uh, the, 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 the status of current academic research uh, that was published in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology. Um, and well, you, we all know uh, the, the fact that um, there is a, a big focus on these uh, crazy metrics, uh, the H index, impact factor, number of publications, and so on, which is uh, um, you know pushing people towards doing poor and, and, and easy uh, uh, publications. Um, and the focus is on the output. Um, and as a statistician of the ethics committee here in Leuven, I see lots of protocols passing by, and and um, yeah, you see a lot of of Quick, quick and dirty studies, basically, where um, they do some retrospective study, they, they get some data from patient files, um, focusing on patients with whatever condition, and then they collect the data they have, and then they do some risk factor study where they put a lot of stuff in a regression model. And uh, that's it. Um, so I think we all know that uh, uh, problem. Uh, 
Papers on prediction uh, models are quite easy as well. You can do just what I said uh, a minute ago. Uh, you collect some uh, data or you use some data set that is already available. Um, if you have a junior colleague who can um, work a little bit with some statistical software, you mix the data and the software together and you get a prediction uh, model paper. And that is something that um, Andrew Vickers together with Angel Cronin uh, already published on in 2010. Um, well, where they state in that paper that uh, this kind of work is particularly easy to do. Uh, they write, you do not need to collect any data or even think of an interesting scientific question. I mean, it's, it's just, you have data, you put it in software and uh, you get going. Um, but the academic incentives also um, uh, forces people to do, I mean, I write here poor and quick peer review. Um, well, I, I see a lot of great peer reviews as well. I mean, I get a lot of uh, very nice peer reviews that I really can do something with and they don't have to be positive. It means if somebody um, doesn't like my paper, but they give a, a, a review where you can do something with, I mean, I'm happy. I mean, I can only be angry at myself that I uh, did not see all the problems that the reviewer noticed, but that's what I like. Uh, I like positive reviews even more, but still. But at the same time, I see so many uh, um, very uh, tiny review reports where, I mean, there is no really in-depth discussion of something. And it's my opinion that some people see it as some uh, ping pong game, it's just part of the academic process. Somebody submits a paper, you ask some questions about it, the authors reply to, to your questions, usually with changing as little as possible to their paper, and then you, uh, you accept it. Um, and I mean, it's my feeling that we have put the bar pretty low. Uh, as as I, I, I put it some weeks ago, like, we know that no study is perfect, but we are interpreting this a bit too easily as anything goes. I mean, everything has limitations. So, okay, as long as you mention your limitations, you're good to go. And that, that feels a bit uneasy uh, uh, to me. So if there are uh, quick and dirty prediction model papers, they pass the peer review stage a bit too easily, in my opinion. And uh, I, while I was on holiday, I um, got, um, peer review report from two papers. Um, one was a clinical paper and one reviewer, uh, I showed a full review here on the screen, uh, wrote 60 words that, I mean, I don't know what to do with that. Um, the other reviewer wrote a constructive uh, review uh, that I could work with and I liked that. So, I mean, you see good things and bad things uh, there. And the other paper was a methodological paper. And it was the same situation. One reviewer was negative but didn't give me anything to work with. I mean, okay, the reviewer didn't like the paper uh, and you know, okay, that's it. Um, and I have to address the issues in uh, a revised version, but you know, I didn't know what to do with that. I mean, he doesn't give any, uh, or she doesn't give any specific uh, um, issues there. And the other reviewer again was very constructive. I was very happy with that. But the result is that we are uh, we end up with a, a, uh, an enormous amount of prediction models in the literature, and this is a slide that I uh, got from Martin, um, where he put some uh, numbers together uh, from a whole bunch of systematic reviews, and I mean we're still counting, so, so we are preparing the next update of our uh, living systematic review of prediction models uh, for COVID-19. And uh, we already had more than 200 models in the previous update. Well, uh, we were a bit disappointed to see how many new models were published in the meantime. Um, and we were also disappointed because it gave us an enormous amount of work to, to, um, to read all these papers. But I mean, there are a lot of models out there and we're counting. Um, and for uh, uh, academic research, uh, the academic incentives, uh, if, if you're applying for research grants, then there is this issue, you all know it pretty well, that uh, there is a, a strong focus on novelty, on groundbreaking uh, research uh, uh, and so on. And so it seems like funding agencies are a bit allergic to incremental uh, research. 
uh, and validation studies of prediction models are one example of incremental research, if you ask me. And I, I put here a reaction from my institution on a grant application that, uh, that they rejected. Um, and they wrote there, the project is good, but not really novel. So, okay. So that was a bit uncomf uncomfortable for me to get this comment. Uh, and then they also wrote that uh, it was rather ambitious. And uh, I have to apologize to my institution for being ambitious. And I promise that I will never be ambitious ever again. Um, but anyway, I mean, okay, it's a good project, but not novel. So uh, it was not uh, important enough to be funded. Okay, we all get a uh, negative report from um, funding uh, uh, submissions, but I mean, this feels a bit, a bit difficult to digest uh, uh, for me. Um, okay, the second enemy or challenge uh, that I list here is uh, about education uh, in the context of statistics and in particular when it comes to prediction. Um, and it is, I, I don't know all the statistics courses around the world, um, and there are many courses meant for non-statisticians, there are also courses in master programs uh, um, to become a statistician and so on, but from my own experience, as well as when I speak to, to a lot of other people, um, statisticians and non-statisticians alike, it seems to be that most statistics courses uh, have insufficient attention for the fact that there are different data analysis tasks and that this really critically impacts on uh, the statistics and on, on the methodology that you are supposed to use in a study. Um, and, and so that, that that's maybe one reason why I see a lot of protocols where they just put all the variables in a regression model, do a stepwise selection on it. And then, I mean, that, that's an analysis that fits many research questions, apparently. But I mean, we would like to make a distinction between uh, descriptive research, uh, explanatory or, or causal uh, uh, research questions and prediction uh, research questions. Um, but I mean, it's my experience that in courses, this is uh, not getting enough uh, attention. And it is also my experience, but please contradict me if you think that I'm wrong here, that regression modeling is often taught implicitly in, in, from a causal perspective and with lots of focus on, uh, on statistical testing um, of, of your uh, uh, regression coefficients and, and so on. And lots of focus on uh, assumptions of the models and how you check them, preferably using uh, significance tests, obviously, yeah, we make significance tests for uh, everything. Um, okay, but it's rarely uh, uh, taught in the context of prediction. Obviously, there are some very dedicated uh, uh, courses that really focus only on prediction, uh, which are very good. Um, there are some very good dedicated books on it, but in, in more general statistics courses, I mean, I think there should be more attention to that. Uh, and so there is a lot of focus on, on technical uh, aspects uh, of uh, analyses, on the computational aspects of analyses, and, and not enough, in my opinion, on uh, design and methodology. And I, that's also the case uh, uh, when it comes to education on machine learning. Uh, again, in my experience, I, I followed some courses myself uh, um, in, in, in that uh, field where uh, you, there's also a lot of focus on, on how to get the algorithms working and how to tune uh, hyperparameters and so on. But, uh, you know, where do you start from? And it, it seems that a lot of courses start from, we have a data set and these are the uh, uh, independent variables and these are, this is a dependent variable. Now, how do we go about that? But you miss the, the, the start of the story, let's say. Uh, right. The third uh, challenge, uh, in my opinion, is a signal to noise ratio, uh, where clinical prediction is a field that is considered to have a pretty low signal to noise ratio. So there is a lot of randomness uh, uh, and other um, reasons for noise in, in our data sets. Um, so it, it is not so easy to find a signal and, and in some other domains, and a typical example is gaming, um, then uh, the signal to noise ratio is, is, is better. Um, and the rules, let's say, are, are clearer uh, or the data generating mechanisms are, are more obvious, uh, let's say. 
I'm, I have no experience of, of uh, uh, research in, in the area of gaming or, or something, but uh, okay. Um, but anyway, for clinical prediction, we, we assume that the signal to noise ratio is, is modest, uh, which in my opinion leads to the, uh, um, to a rule of thumb that we should keep our modeling uh, as simple as possible. Um, and this is also supported by some papers. Uh, there is this well-known paper from David Hand, which is not uh, focusing on clinical prediction per se, uh, but on uh, prediction in more general uh, terms. Um, but there, even there, he says that um, simple methods uh, typically yield performance that is similar as that of more sophisticated uh, uh, methods and that the difference in performance may be swamped by other sources of uncertainty that are generally not considered in the classical supervised classification paradigm. Okay, anyway, um, that, that's a little bit what I mean. So, um, but there are some other papers out there that do focus on, on uh, uh, clinical prediction where they have the same uh, uh, message. Um, so signal to noise ratio is often quite low. So, um, flexible uh, uh, methods then we think usually of, of some um, boosting uh, xj boost or deep learning or whatever kind of uh, complicated methods uh, may not always have a lot to offer um, but still uh, there are some papers out there that seem to suggest that um, it is really in the situation where things are noisy in terms of uh, inputs and, and outputs that that is a situation where complex models uh, will be more useful than, than more simple or traditional uh, models. I mean, I, I have some difficulties to, to agree with that. Uh, I do agree with the fact that um, they focus, that they state that you should have large enough data sets, but uh, I don't think that when there is a lot of noise that uh, complex models will be more useful per se. Um, uh, there are these examples where uh, people say that if you have data from electronic health records with tens of thousands of potential predictors, that then um, uh, uh, machine learning will uh, help you out better than uh, regression modeling. I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm, I always feel that we should uh, keep uh, uh, predictor selection and model fitting as separate as possible. And if you really don't know at all which predictors may be uh, uh, important to put in your model, then it is my feeling that uh, maybe you're not ready to fit a decent model yet. Um, but maybe other people have different opinions there. Um, a fourth uh, challenge is heterogeneity, uh, which we can uh, see on a lot of levels. Um, so the performance of a model uh, will depend on the underlying population. And this may vary a lot uh, between, uh, and I write here, countries, regions, hospitals, practices, and also patient subgroups. And with patient subgroups, I, I also hint a little bit uh, to the discussion about fairness of machine learning algorithms. That's a topic where I'm not an expert in, so I will not uh, um, have a lot of opinions there yet uh, before I read up on, on, on the matter. But it is definitely a case that there is uh, a lot of heterogeneity on a lot of levels. And this um, makes me think that uh, there is no such thing as a validated uh, model. Um, so I've seen uh, journals who have special issues uh, about machine learning prediction models, and they say, well, um, you have to include an external validation of your model in your paper. And then uh, the idea is good, but one external validation doesn't mean much. And I mean, I don't know a lot of people who uh, would like to introduce a new prediction model and then include uh, an external validation in their paper with poor results. So, I mean, they can put all the validation results in there, but who are we to believe that? I mean, if I publish a new model and I say, look at the validation that I uh, have done, it's, it's fantastic. Then none of you have to believe that. I mean, we need um, validation, good validation studies by uh, uh, other people as well and, and in several different uh, settings. Um, um, and 
Yeah, there was this interesting paper in, in JAMA uh, last year where they looked at um, the origin of cohorts uh, from uh, US cohorts that were used to train deep learning algorithms. And in that paper, they, they, they uh, observed that most cohorts originate from uh, California, Massachusetts, and New York, which is not a surprise perhaps. And these are states in which some uh, leading academic institutions are, are located. Uh, but that cohorts from other parts of the United States are, are pretty rare. Uh, so you may wonder how um, the, the, the models that are being trained on these cohorts, how they generalize to, to other regions uh, in the United States, uh, let alone outside the United States. So I, th I think that was an interesting uh, table to, to show in this context. And then another aspect here is that um, there is a factor of time. Um, the world is dynamic, so things change. Uh, the care changes, referral patterns change, uh, reimbursement strategies change, so healthcare changes on a daily basis. And this has an impact on, on the accuracy of, of uh, the predictions you get from some model. So uh, we can assume that the accuracy or the reliability of your predictions um, will decrease uh, over time, uh, which again uh, uh, brings me to the idea that there is no such thing as a validated uh, uh, model. If you validate a model now uh, in your hospital, it works well, that's great, but it's um, who, who can tell you that it will still work five years from now? So. And that brings us to, to um, the, the claim that uh, models uh, should ideally be adapted to local settings and should also be monitored uh, uh, over time. But then I always wonder how realistic that is. If, if we know that, I mean, probably a lot of research is being done at tertiary academic hospitals. Um, and what about the, the more regional hospitals where there is little to no uh, uh, room for research, uh, where there are no resources? How are these hospitals going to adapt models to their setting? And how are these hospitals going to monitor uh, the performance of these models uh, uh, over time? So that, that it doesn't make things easier, all this heterogeneity. Um, but at least we have to try and take the heterogeneity into account when we develop models, um, when we validate models, and uh, when we would like to use models, it, 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 it is worthwhile to consider updating it to your specific setting. Uh, but um, all of that, it's easier said than done, I think. Um, a fifth challenge uh, is that perfect risk estimates are utopic. Um, so yeah, we would like to have uh, uh, prediction models that give um, uh, uh, accurate risk estimates, but what does it mean accurate risk estimates? Uh, a couple of years ago, I tried to, to, to make a hierarchy in, in um, levels of calibration of risk estimates. Uh, going from mean calibration, where the mean estimated risk uh, corresponds to the overall um, uh, event rate of the outcome, uh, let's say, and the, the highest level was strong calibration, which means that, um, uh, that the estimated uh, risk is uh, correct for every covariate pattern, so conditional on the, the, the predictors you have in the model for every possible combination of predictor values, uh, the estimated risk of the model uh, is correct. So it corresponds to the observed proportion of people with the outcome that is being predicted. Um, that's of course what we want, but that's utopic. Uh, it, yeah, it requires a model to be fully correct. And I think intuitively most people understand that that is, is, is quite difficult to achieve. There are a lot of uh, arguments um, to give, uh, to back up the claim that this is utopic. I mean, if, if you use a logistic regression, uh, regression, well, is that the correct model form? Uh, maximum likelihood is only asymptotically unbiased. Um, it took, uh, um, perfect risk estimates require, uh, 
correct modeling of all nonlinearities and non additivities uh, that are underlying in the data, which is, is uh, maybe that's not easy. Uh, some people say, well, that's why we need machine learning algorithms. But uh, uh, as I will say later, these uh, will typically require more data to, to correctly model all of these nonlinearities uh, that may be present in the data um, or in the data generating mechanism. Uh, there are things like measurement error. So is there a true model anyway? Uh, um, uh, so there are uh, other arguments that you can give um, to say that perfect risk estimates can never be achieved. Um, and one note I have to make here is that if you have a large uh, validation study and you uh, evaluate calibration of the risk estimates, and you get a nice diagonal calibration curve, uh, which is what we want, that this is not enough to, to have strong calibration. Uh, it goes beyond uh, um, what you can see in calibration uh, curves. Uh, a sixth uh, challenge uh, relates to measurement and data quality. Um, it's a very important thing that is um, difficult and maybe not given the attention that it should uh, or that it, uh, that it deserves. Uh, and you can talk about different things uh, um, in this context. One thing is missing values, which is something that's a very difficult subject definitely for non-statisticians, but also for statisticians. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, it's a very uh, important but difficult field. I'm also uncertain myself when I, when I see data with missing values as to what should we do with that. It's easy to say, well, oh, I'm a statistician. I will do multiple imputation, and that's always the good solution. Well, there are exceptions to the rule, um, I understand. So it, it, is, it is a tricky thing. Um, and, and definitely when, when you're talking about electronic health records, the definition of missing data changes. I mean, if you collect data in the context of clinical routine and you didn't measure something, is that a missing data point? I mean, uh, the clinician maybe didn't do anything wrong by not measuring uh, that uh, value. Um, measurement error is another uh, uh, thing and the definition of um, when and how you measure your uh, predictors. Um, and I think that is something that is very difficult to align between uh, settings, uh, which further adds to the heterogeneity and, and to the noise in the data and, and, and so on. Um, so there are a lot of uh, differences in procedure for measuring biomarkers, for example, uh, and the timing of that. And, and uh, even as a statistician, I mean, you have to understand the data that you're working with. But I also experience that sometimes I learn something new and something important 10 years after starting to work on some uh, problem that it, it, it strikes me that it is, it is very difficult as a non-clinician to really fully understand everything uh, from the clinical aspect of, of these uh, uh, studies. Um, so sometimes you, you, you take something for granted that uh, also measurements will have been done at the, uh, the, the recruitment visit uh, of a study, but then 10 years later, you realize that no, it is not measured at that moment. It's actually measured at some moment later in time, uh, maybe even before the recruitment visit in the study and, and, and so on. So it's, it's a very tricky thing as well. And then there is also the outcome um, where uh, uh, the outcome that you're trying to predict, and that's specifically uh, something, well, not only obviously, but specifically something that is being discussed in the context of deep learning on medical images, where you need some annotation uh, of the images. Uh, and that is very difficult to, to, to get, to get quality labels. Uh, so, I mean, in, in a lot of studies, the, the images should best be uh, evaluated by several experts in the field uh, to come to uh, a consensus judgment and to understand how much experts differ in, in, in um, their evaluation of the same image. Uh, but you can imagine that in practice, there are, are no financial or resources or there is not the time to 
have multiple experts available to look at thousands of images, for example. So that, that's a difficult uh, thing. And Hugh Harvey has this great tweet about it that, uh, well, it's not data, it's not the algorithm, it's the label. So it's actually the quality of, of the, the, uh, uh, the data that you have that matters. And so I, I stumbled across this cartoon that tells a lot, I think. So things like data cleaning is not the most exciting part of, of what we do, but it is uh, um, quite important. Uh, and, and some people may see, may look at it as a, a kind of punishment, um, but uh, yeah, we shouldn't uh, actually. The seventh uh, challenge is uh, that methodology needs to be improved. Of course, that's not independent from the first challenge that I mentioned, which are the academic incentives. Uh, but in systematic reviews of prediction models where they do a quality appraisal of the models, you see time and time again, the conclusion that the uh, quality of the methodology was suboptimal. Um, one thing is sample size. Um, where by now uh, research has debunked the 10 events per variable or 10 events per parameter rule of thumb. Uh, this is uh, research by, for example, Richard Riley and, and Maarten van Smeed and, and, and Gary Collins and colleagues. Um, so even for pre-specified regression models, which is basically a simple situation, you're not doing variable selection, you are not looking at random forests or whatever, pre-specified logistic regression models, even then the 10 events per parameter is, is insufficient. And I, I, the figure that I show here in the slide is something that I made myself uh, based on uh, Richard Riley's sample size paper that he published last year in the British Medical Journal, uh, where you see that the minimum uh, events per parameter based on their methodology, uh, strongly depends on the outcome event fraction. And maybe if you, your outcome is rare, uh, 10 EPP may be sufficient because then you have so much uh, non-events per predictor as well. But if your outcome event fraction moves towards 50%, then uh, I mean, you, you really need a lot more than um, 10 EPV or EPP to be on the safe uh, uh, side. And if you use complex algorithms, um, then uh, there are indications in the literature that these require a lot more data. Uh, so this paper uh, from uh, the team from Ewart Steyerberg, they suggest that these complex algorithms may need over 10 times as many events per variable. So if 10 uh, EPP is insufficient for pre-specified logistic regression models, then okay, where are we for um, uh, safely uh, uh, developing uh, machine learning based prediction models? Uh, you need a lot more. So, and, and yeah, you, you can make the analogy to cars. I mean, you, you can dream of a, a beautiful Porsche, but if you cannot or you do not want to pay for it, you may get something that only vaguely looks like what you had in mind um, in your dreams. And, and the same applies to developing risk models, uh, but you don't need money, you need data. Uh, to get data, you need money, but you know what I mean. Um, but beyond sample size, uh, prediction modeling is, is misleading. And I already said it uh, at the beginning, making a prediction model paper is not so difficult. But that's the misleading part about it. It looks easy, but if you want to do it properly, uh, it isn't so easy. Uh, uh, if you read the correct books, uh, books from Ewald, from Richard Riley, uh, and, and, and other people, um, you, you, you know, uh, you learn the right things to, to do it, but it, it's not so easy as it may look at first uh, uh, sight. And then, some years ago, we, we uh, did a systematic review of studies in which they compared prediction models based on logistic regression uh, with prediction models using one or more machine learning algorithms. Um, and we looked at uh, the methodology of these papers. Um, and first of all, if we look at uh, sample size, uh, we, we saw that the median events per parameter was eight with a huge variability. And I, I made this plot uh, of events per parameter by outcome event fraction of all the models that we, we, 
looked at in, in the systematic review. And I put the minimum events per parameter line in red on the plot. It's the line that I showed you some slides earlier. Uh, the y-axis is on log scale here. And you see that a lot of models were based on uh, uh, data where the events per parameter was clearly insufficient. Um, and if you looked at the methodology, then, for example, uh, missing data, actually, there was no paper that had a clear and appropriate account of uh, uh, what they did with missing data. So about half of the papers were completely unclear. You, 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 you knew about nothing, uh, but there was no paper where they uh, had a decent approach that was clearly described. So if, if somebody uh, uses multiple imputation, and that's all they write. So we addressed missing values using multiple imputation and that's it. You don't read anything else. Well, that's not clear in my opinion. You need to explain uh, how you did that. And there was one paper, for example, that um, set the, the, the highest and the lowest percent of values of each continuous variable to missing to avoid uh, the impact of possible outliers. But then they used mean imputation on these missing values. So what that paper did was replace the extreme values of a variable with the mean. Uh, then I, yeah, I mean, what can I say about that? Um, <clears throat> it doesn't make you happy if you read that. Um, and when it comes to performance validation, two thirds of the papers uh, used a biased or unclear approach. So a lot of papers use no validation at all. Some papers optimize the model using test data. Some papers use cross-validation for to validate a model, but they did not repeat all the steps um, that were involved in building the model, such as variable selection or uh, tuning hyperparameters. Um, some uh, studies did variable selection on all data and then did a train test split and so on. So you, you read a lot of stuff uh, that is not, uh, uh, not okay. Uh, a minority of papers look at calibration of the risk estimates. That's well known. You read that in a lot of systematic reviews. When the outcome was prognostic, um, then the time horizon was often ignored completely. So they simply looked whether the event of interest happened within the follow-up time they had available for each patient, but that follow-up time could vary greatly uh, between patients. So that's not really... Um, uh, nice. Uh, one study used matching. They matched patients with and without the outcome that uh, they wanted to predict. They matched these groups for age and gender, and then they used age and gender as predictors of the outcome. I mean, really? Uh, um, yeah. That. Uh, what can we say? So there is uh, room for improvement. And uh, some other uh, reviews uh, say similar things about methodology, and I list some recent ones uh, here. Um, so there is a lot of room uh, there. And, and, and yeah, one recent model um, that I read was a model to uh, estimate the risk of first trimester miscarriage in very early pregnancies where they had no validation at all. It was data from a single institution. And if you know the issues uh, surrounding the, uh, well, the issue of heterogeneity, then single institution models are a bit, I mean, we're beyond that, I, I would say, um, where possible. And also their most important predictor was missing in 79% of cases. Uh, which isn't serious anymore, in, in, in my opinion. And they also noticed that the, uh, the, 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 um, the fraction of uh, pregnancies that ended up in a miscarriage was much higher in their study than in, in, in most other studies, but they didn't see any issue in that. So th th this means that uh, they used some kind of high-risk population and if you use their risk estimates in, in non-high risk uh, uh, early pregnancies uh, or lower risk early pregnancies, then uh, you will be in trouble. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, challenge number eight um, relates to models uh, with a diagnostic uh, outcome. Um, 
why do we make prediction models for a diagnostic outcome? Uh, well, because the, the, the gold standard is invasive or is costly, and we want to have a more efficient approach to, to guide uh, uh, patient management. Um, and so, but if you want to develop models uh, for such diagnostic outcomes, you do need unselected cohorts of patients that do have the gold standard, which is invasive or costly or or has other uh, difficulties. So you will run into practical, financial, ethical issues, uh, maybe uh, to, to get such a cohort. Uh, and an example is, is a research on the diagnosis of ovarian cancer that I've been working on or collaborating on uh, for uh, more than 10 years now, uh, where the gold standard um, is uh, the histology after uh, surgery for the ovarian mass, um, but of course they want they cannot do surgery on everyone with a uh, ovarian mass to know whether is whether it is benign or malignant, and so we make uh, prediction models to help clinicians in determining who they can manage conservatively and who they should operate and by whom these people should be operated and should they be referred to to a specialist who does this every day, or can the operation be done locally because it's not such a high risk uh, uh, case, uh, uh, for example. Usually uh, these uh, models in, in, in this field have been developed on patients who have been operated on because then they have histology and they have the gold standard. But of course, a lot of uh, women with a MAS are not operated on because uh, the clinician thought it was okay to follow the patient conservatively. So you have a bias uh, there. Um, and we, we have done one study where we included all patients. So uh, patients who were operated on for their mass because they wanted to or because the mass looked suspicious, as well as patients who were not operated on because the mass looked harmless or because the patient refused to be operated. And uh, so we validated the existing models on all, all masses, also those who are not operated on. But then you run into other issues like what's the outcome of the tumor for patients who are not operated for their mass? You, you run into issues there. Uh, we, I know there are, there are some methodological papers about that uh, um, to try and deal with this problem. And we dealt with it, uh, uh, among other things, with multiple imputation. Um, uh, I think it was a reasonable approach to, to deal with it, um, but I mean, you can think of other approaches uh, uh, as well. A similar challenge uh, can be given for uh, uh, prediction models for prognostic uh, uh, outcomes, uh, where you, you, you follow up patients uh, sometime after uh, um, time zero, uh, the time at which you make the predictor measurements and get the risk estimate. And then you follow up the patient for some time to see whether and when the outcome of interest occurs. But a lot of, a lot of stuff can happen. Uh, first thing is quite simple. If, if you want to predict uh, some uh, event happening within the next 10 years, it's quite difficult to have a very good uh, follow-up for uh, uh, such a long period of time for uh, uh, a large number of patients. Um, but there will be loss to follow-up and, and I mean, is it always uninformative? Probably not, I, I suspect. Uh, there are a lot of competing events that may take place uh, and even more tricky can be intermittent uh, uh, decisions uh, about treatment or changes in the treatment that a patient is being uh, given. Um, and Non van Geloven has written a very nice paper about that, uh, which was published last year. Um, so for example, if you, if you would like to have unselected cohorts of patients without treatment, that would be uncommon to have, um, and so on, and so on, and so on. So there are a lot of other uh, um, tricky things that can distort your risk estimates uh, um, when you want to make models for these kind of outcomes. Challenge number 10 um, is complete and transparent reporting. This is pretty well known. Uh, I will not spend a lot of time here. Um, 
well, I actually, I think that a clear account of what you did is actually more informative than the result of any kind of validation that you report in your model development paper. Um, again, I mean, who will uh, um, introduce a new model and uh, publish poor validations in, in the same paper? So um, if you introduce a new model, I think the, the, the methodology is the key thing to look at. And of course, we do need validation efforts. Uh, I, I'm not saying that I am in favor of papers that have no validation at all. But in any case, uh, a clear description of what happened uh, is, is, um, is extremely important. And this, is, well, this enemy, as I write here, is pretty easy to beat. Uh, I mean, there are lots of reporting guidelines and for prediction modeling. It's a tripod guideline. It's out there, uh, well, use it. Um, it's quite easy, but still, yeah, I mean, uh, I review a lot of uh, papers in which prediction models are being introduced and the majority doesn't use it. Um, so even there, there's a lot of work to be done. And when we're talking about machine learning models or just any type of complicated model, um, it, it, is, it is more difficult to make available than a regression model for which you can uh, pretty easy, easily present the formula in your paper um, such that other people can use it. Uh, of course, it's not a big problem to make machine learning models available uh, using software objects or calculators or apps. Um, but of course, these bring about other uh, issues, tricky things. Uh, th these uh, uh, things should be error free, should be easy to use, um, should be well documented. So it's easy to present a calculator these days, but um, you have to warn people um, about the status of the research about a model. If, if somebody just stumbles upon your calculator, um, it should be quite uh, clear to these people uh, um, at first sight uh, what status this model has. Has it been validated? Uh, uh, where has it been validated? And so on and so on. Uh, so, um, you can make any model available, but um, you have to do it uh, uh, well. But again, you can say this is not a very big enemy. It is not that uh, uh, hard to solve. But in my opinion, it, it does not happen uh, very, very often. You see a lot of calculators indeed, but uh, are they always very well documented? Um, I have my doubts about that. Number 11 um, is uh, the issue of commercial interests. Um, well, commercial interests do not have to be bad by definition. Um, we need financial resources to, to do good studies. Uh, and um, if there is a commercial input, then uh, maybe um, there are a bit more financial resources available. But at the same time, in commercial interests, uh, they hamper other important aspects of research. I mean, uh, it, the word commercial interest says, it's, uh, says it all. I mean, um, they have other interests than a, a purely not-for-profit effort uh, uh, in, in the context of prediction modeling. Uh, how open are these companies regarding uh, their model, regarding the validations? And the problems they may have had in their validations. Um, sometimes if, if uh, there is a model that is being offered on uh, uh, a fee per patient basis um, and you want to know how well it works in your hospital, uh, you need a lot of money to, to pay for, let's say, uh, 500 patients uh, uh, on which you want to apply the model if you have to pay per patient. Um, and in terms of our COVID uh, uh, systematic review, uh, we observed that companies often did not react when we asked them to, to send us reports about uh, the, the models that they um, are uh, selling. Um, even though some websites claimed that the model was being used successfully on thousands of patients already, um, but if you ask them for a report, um, then um, you get silence in return uh, quite often. Um, and uh, a recent paper um, uh, from the group of Karandeep Singh also writes similar things uh, that uh, the proprietary models 
um, that there is a problem with openness um, uh, that we should address in some way. We should not uh, um, avoid any commercial interest. I mean, uh, it's probably hard to avoid that, but there should be uh, some um, um, procedures in place to, to keep things as open as possible. And there are so several recent papers that that, that um, make this statement, um, where they find out that uh, artificial intelligence tools that are being used in hospitals are um, not well documented. Uh, that it is unclear to users um, how well it actually performs, uh, and so on. So uh, this is clearly an issue that deserves attention. And it makes me think of the the the, the recent um, uh, uh, events surrounding the Theranos uh, trial in in the United States. I'm not saying that I'm following it uh, that closely, uh, but that's also uh, they were promising to to uh, have fantastic diagnostic testing. Uh, that was cheap and you only required very little blood to do so and, and so on. And well, most of you know what happened with that company. That didn't go well. But there are other examples that you can give. Uh, I don't think I have the time to go into detail about that, but there was the GP at hand app where patients can at home enter symptoms to the app and then the app will give you a first diagnosis um, and experts were complaining that this app didn't work very well, that um, the model was based on clean cases that were uh, provided by clinicians, whereas if people use it at home in whatever condition they are in, then uh, the situation is not so clean and uh, the app gives very problematic diagnoses that uh, um, uh, cause anxiety for no reason or maybe miss something important and so on. But the company behind the app uh, just didn't uh, uh, mind that much and, and kept going. So um, challenge number 12 is and the implementation in practice. Um, a prediction model should very easily fit into the workflow. I, I, I can imagine that clinicians around the world are short in time anyway. Um, I am not talking about uh, this pandemic situations, but normal situations already, it's, it's, they're quite busy. Um, so what additional actions are needed to, to get the predictions uh, in particular, what specific actions have to be done by the staff to get the predictions. But if you're talking about electronic health records based models, then uh, behind the scenes, a lot of stuff has to be done by linking data. My experience with it uh, um, is that even in the same hospital, different departments use different data collection or data storage systems. And it's not always easy, even within the same hospital, to link data from one patient together. Uh, so data from uh, the intensive care units is in a, a completely different format than data from the same patient outside the intensive care unit and so on, but it all has to be linked uh, if needed. Um, there has to be done something about missing values. And yes, mean imputation is very handy then, it's very quickly done, but it's often, it's, it's not a very good solution. Um, so it's not very easy to, to implement it uh, um, from the IT perspective, uh, but also not to make it uh, easy to use by the clinicians uh, them, themselves. And then yeah, clinicians also should at least consider the, the, the predictions and the recommendations that uh, uh, are given by a model. And there are some studies, impact studies of prediction models where the researchers found that uh, clinicians largely ignored the, um, the predictions and the recommendations given by a model. So there are some other psychosocial aspects uh, there. Um, how is the model supported by clinicians, by the hospital board, by national or international guidelines? Um, it's not because the model is implemented uh, in, in a nice way in, in some uh, um, electronic format that uh, clinicians will use and, and follow it. Uh, there are a lot of aspects there that can go wrong. And if you uh, um, follow the recommendation given by a model and it turns out to be the wrong thing, so 
you see a patient with an ovarian tumor and a model says, well, you can follow this patient conservatively and you can see her again six months from now. And you send the patient home and one month later, uh, they are being brought into uh, the hospital um, because of the tumor ruptured or something and, and um, God knows what happened. Who is to be blamed uh, then? Uh, is it, uh, I, I don't know how that works out. I think I've read somewhere that we have to await the first real lawsuit cases uh, to see what will happen in practice in such a situation. But these are also aspects to, to pay attention to. And more generally, when we're talking about implementation and practices that impact studies are uh, just difficult to do. Um, models are complex interventions. They have to be embedded in practice. Uh, do you give recommendations together with risk estimates or not? What kind of recommendations do you give uh, and, and so on? So it, it's, it's not a very easy thing to, to implement, uh, as I said before. Um, the ideal design is often stated to be a cluster randomized study in which you compare prediction model with the current uh, um, standard of care. Uh, for example, uh, these are very cumbersome studies to look at or to, to prepare and conduct. And the choice of the endpoints of such studies is a difficult one. It's quite easy to use process related uh, outcomes like how many patients did you refer and how many referrals were justified and how many operations did you do, how many unnecessary operations were there and so on. These are the easier endpoints, but these are actually intermediate outcomes. Um, more interesting would be to look at longer term outcomes on patient level. And that is that requires more time. It's more difficult. Uh, we can always, uh, almost by definition expect lower effect sizes. Uh, further down the road, uh, so that is, is, is a very difficult um, discussion. We have tried ourselves to do an impact study uh, some years ago, and then I experienced firsthand uh, what difficulties there are uh, um, in doing so. And in our study, we noticed that people largely ignored the predictions from the new uh, model because they they prefer to stick to the, the old uh, procedures that they uh, used using an older model. So it, it, it is uh, very difficult to do. Um, and in this context, there is also the prediction paradox. This is mainly something for prognostic models, um, which means that using a model makes it invalid. Uh, so if you make a model to, to um, estimate or uh, the, the risk that someone will get a, a in-hospital infection and the model uh, gives a high risk estimate and then the healthcare staff does all sorts of interventions to that, that avoid the infection from happening. Well, then you understand that uh, uh, using the model changes healthcare and just changes the whole situation and, and may make risk estimates completely invalid. So that's some kind of paradox that uh, um, I don't know how easy it is to solve that. Um, uh, you don't have that uh, uh, for diagnostic models um, because, okay, it's more of a cross-sectional uh, problem um, in, in some way, uh, but you do have that for prognostic uh, models. So it's not because you have implemented a, a model and it, it has an impact on patient outcomes that um, the, your work is done. And then to end with, um, I had this short uh, um, excerpt from a House of Cards episode. I'm, I'm uh, hugely behind on all the series hype. I mean, uh, I just watched House of Cards last year I'm very sorry. I'm I, now I'm watching Vikings. I noticed that this is also uh, six years old already. Oh, I'm uh, um, extremely uh, behind all, all all of that stuff. And most of the, the the important series I never watched. I never watched one minute of Game of Thrones, for example. I have no clue what it is about. But anyway, th this thing in in House of Cards. I don't know if it will play because you know how it goes. You want to embed a video in PowerPoint and then it never works. <laughs> so, but uh, let's see if, if, if it, uh, it's not important, it's just funny.
it, it will not work, I'm quite sure, right? So it doesn't work. Yeah. There you go. I, uh, I knew it would happen, but I tried it anyway. Uh, if you don't try it, you don't know it. So um, that's the end of what I had to say. I hope it was useful. I don't know if you liked uh, uh, a high level overview of issues uh, rather than a more in-depth methodological discussion uh, of, of some specific issues. But uh, yeah, it, it was a list of, of issues that I had in my head for a long time and I thought it might be interesting to to talk about it one day. So I hope you liked it. And if you have some questions, uh, positive, negative, let me know. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben, um, for your time and sharing all of your experiences and, and wisdom with us. Really, really appreciate it. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording.